Hello, welcome to the pod. I'm Nathan Fink. I'm Jolyn Drennan, and this is New Hampshire Family Now. A show about building family in the Granite State. Today on the show, Jolyn turns the tables. We talk bee prevention, and later, Carol Lunen, family support director and parenting facilitator at the Grapevine, gives me a few things to think about. New Hampshire Family Now is brought to you by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Since 1962, the Charitable Foundation has worked hand-in-hand with generous and visionary citizens to maximize the power of giving and support, collaborate, and lead innovative initiatives. Initiatives like New Hampshire Tomorrow, which is focused on making sure children and families have access to education, health care, and career pathways to ensure every family member thrives. To learn more about New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and all their initiatives, go to www. Dot nhcf.org. Hello again, and welcome to the podcast. You know, I'm, I'm going to just stop you right there. Now? Me? But I have so many questions. That's exactly, that's why I'm stopping you. Um, so I've been re-listening to our first um, few episodes, and all you do is come in here and pepper me with questions. Um, and then there I am, mess, my life's on display. Well, th- there's things I need to know. Like, for example, how's that leg? How's the soccer team? Did you stock it illegally or? Nope, we're not, we're not, no. It's, this is uncomfortable. So there's things that I'd like to know too, like, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? Well, uh, at the Children's Trust, I'm the director of advancement, which means I spend a great deal of uh, thinking about things like primary prevention and what it is, how to talk about it in a way that engages people. Like Child Abuse Prevention Month? Yeah, exactly. So tell me about that, this year's April campaign. Well, you know, as you know, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. And um, if I'm honest, it kind of comes from these two realizations around the strengthening families work that's being done by much of the family resource centers. Um, around, you know, last year at this time, right before my youngest son, when he turned two, you know, we we're all in this kind of brave new world of COVID and the work being done by everybody out there trying to respond. And then you layer on top of that being a parent, being a worker, come school teacher, all of these different layers of responsibilities. And, you know, I remember I was putting Winnie to bed and it was like 8 p.m. or something like that. And he just, you wouldn't settle in and he was flailing and scratching and he still can get a little bitey. And, you know, I just felt my frustration climbing and climbing and, you know, I, my temperature just kept going up. I remember something that uh, pediatrician, Dr. Wendy Gladstone had said to me a year before around, you know, her work for many years in a forensic child abuse and neglect. And she said that the vast majorities of of, of abuse cases that she had seen had come from when parents are trying to correct a behavior that they see as problematic. And that's when it occurred to me. I thought, oh my gosh, abuse and neglect can happen in a house just like mine. And that shook me, but it also made me really think about all of those preconceived notions that I have and what happens when parents' stressors overtake their access to resources. Um, The second realization I had was that there's an ocean between my understanding of primary prevention in my work life and in my parent life. You know, when I think about prevention, I first engage, say, the logical side of my brain. And I understand, you know, I understand it in my work as, you know, the strengthening family's protective factors, uh, resilience, social connection, knowledge of parenting and childhood development, concrete supports in times of need, and the social and emotional competence of children. And now that we're in this COVID situation and world where it Half the time I'm spent at home with my boys running around, the moment they bust into the house, everything I think I know about prevention goes out the window because there's no space for academic thinking at that point or logical brain. It's just me reacting. And I thought, well, if that's my experience, you know, and I know what these things are, social connections, I should go out, I should connect socially. It's going to help lower my stress. Why can't I do it? Because I don't really place it inside the everyday of my life. There's not a human factor there. And so I thought, oh my gosh, we have to define what this looks like in my life, in your life. But also, what does that look like? And so, you know, I kept thinking about what does child abuse uh, prevention really look like when we flip it on its head? And well, I started listing them out. When my neighbor comes over to watch my children, I can finish my work day, my stress drops, I have a social connection. Connection, that's an act of prevention. You know, when I go over to Jones, my other neighbor who is older, and I shovel her driveway so she can go to uh, um, doctor's appointment, that's an act of prevention. And, you know, when my wife and I reach out to our fa- local family resource center because 
you know, we need to talk about financial planning. Prevention is this noun. It's the act of something not happening, you know, but to prevent is a verb. And that when we start thinking in verbs about it, we start empowering ourselves to be actors in this thing called prevention. So I think that, uh, yeah, when you're thinking about primary prevention, it's a discipline noun, um, but in action, it's a verb. And it's something you can, you know, you're, it's once it's ingrained in you, um, it's, it's becomes your, it becomes how you behave. And then you're the, setting the example for your child. So one uh, thing I actually wanted to ask you about was the, the social connection um the video that you did for our campaign i thought it was so well done and i think that it was so well interpretive of i think every every mother that has had a a newborn i think could have just been right in that video and so that was not an actress Right. No, that was a real person in her day. So when we went through, we had to think um, about what we were trying to accomplish in this COVID safe environment. So we looked at how are we potting so we can do this safely? How are we capturing a person's experience in their day? Um, and so what we wound up doing is looking for parents to live their experience. Uh, you know, the first one was me and that was a, a day in the life and uh, our filmmaker followed me around for, I think, three days um, and kind of I was wearing the same clothes for three days. But she, yeah, that's her her newborn, her child, uh, her second child. And that was part of our strategy was to find people that were real. And, uh, and if they could give us access uh, in a way that was safe, we would take as much as it, of it as we could. Yeah. It, no, I mean, it was, it was incredible. I think everybody that watched it um, in my uh, in my world was like, wow, that's you know. Jacqueline Rowland, who is the um, coordinator for the Avenue A Teen Center, after she watched that and we were talking about it, she said, gosh, that's edgy. Isn't it interesting that what you have to go through as a parent is edgy? And when we were building that out and doing final cuts of it, I kept thinking, can we show that? And then I kept thinking, that's the day in the life of a parent. Yes, you can show that and you should show that. Why would you be afraid of showing what a parent goes through? You know, and I get super stirred up about this because I'm like, that's parenting. And if we don't, if we want to look away from it, you actually don't want to look at parenting. But why do you think you asked yourself, do you think, hold on, let me frame this. Do you think you asked yourself, can we show that? Do you think the fact that we live in this like social media app Avatar, everyone has to look perfect all the time. World had any impact on you on you questioning yourself. Can we show that? Can we show what's real? I wanted to show what it was like. And, you know, there's parts that is are, you know, like ug ugly, I guess. And I don't even think ugly. As a parent, when I look at that, I don't see ugly. I see resilience and strength every time. What scares me about the social media aspect of it is that I don't know that investors, stakeholders, legislators, I don't know what their level of readiness is to say, oh, you mean you're basically breastfeeding all day? Yeah, that's what it's like. And right at the end of that spot, she looks to see how many milliliters she has. That was our experience, experience with our son because he was five weeks early. And so there was thoughts of gavage feeding where they put a tiny tube with a dropper down his throat into his stomach. And so the battle over milliliters and then just what that takes was incredible. And when I see her look at that and say, not what I'd like, but what are you going to do? I nearly burst into tears every time because it takes me to a place that is very meaningful to me. I know. I just know. I, I loved it. I love that it was very, um, it was very raw and it was very real and it was not contrived or purposeful, but that's, it's just not what you see. And it, what's ironic too is when you pull away what you see, which is polished and you put in its stead what parenting is, the parenting is, is so much stronger. I appreciate the question. I do. I know that you've flipped the script completely, but I do have one question before we end the episode. Sure. How's that ankle? People have asked me, is JoLynn going to make it? I have made a full recovery. Thank you. But our game got rained out on Sunday. So I don't know. We're going to be able to see the uh, skills in action until next weekend. No air cast, no boot, no uh, ace bandage. Nothing. I made them run laps. I ran with them. There was a lot of heavy breathing and whining. So I think I probably should tone it down. <laughs> yeah. You got to stop whining so much about Not me. Not me. I wasn't <laughs> whining. They were whining. Um, no. It's UA, not college. So. 
So. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jolyn, for being here as always. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our April prevention campaign. To learn more about it, go to www.nhchildrenstrust.org backslash prevention. And when we come back, we'll hear from Carol Lunen, Family Support Director and Parenting Facilitator at The Grapevine, a family resource center in Antrim, New Hampshire. Don't go anywhere. This podcast was brought to you by Nixon Peabody, who delivers exceptional legal services for clients in the community by combining high performance, an entrepreneurial spirit, deep engagement, and an unwavering commitment to a culture of collaboration, diversity, and humanity. Nixon Peabody works with universities, hospitals, and nonprofits of every size to maximize impact. For more information, visit nixonpeabody.com. Today's show was also brought to you by the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the Child Advocacy and Protection Program, a multidisciplinary program with the Children's Hospital established to evaluate and provide integrative care to suspected victims of child maltreatment. Together, a team of physicians, advanced practice registered nurses, social workers, nurses, and child life specialists work to provide consultation and evaluations of children who are suspected victims of abuse, so to serve in the best interest of children and families at multiple levels of prevention. For more information about Children's Hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the Child Advocacy Protection Program, visit www.chadkids.org backslash child dash advocacy. I'd like to introduce Carol Lunen, the Family Support Director and Parent Group Facilitator at The Grapevine, a family and community resource center in Antrim, New Hampshire. Hello, Carol, and thank you for joining us on the pod. What is parenting facilitation? And as a facilitator, what is your role? My role is to help people talk through things because I think often when parents bring up the question about something, the answer is already floating around inside of them someplace. Because if they're aware enough to ask the question, then the answer is probably probably there. They already know what they would rather not do. They already know what's not worked for them. They already know the successes that they've had in the past. They already know what feels good to them when they do it. So I can help them to get to that by asking questions sometimes, or sometimes just listening to what they're saying. Or sometimes another parent will say, this is what happened to me in that situation, and this is what I tried. I, I want to be able to help each parent to find out what happens, what works for them in their family and for them. Are there specific topics that in a group like this do come up more often than not? Yeah, development comes up a lot where people ask questions about something that happened again this morning. Somebody asked me a question about something their son was doing, two years old. Um, is that normal? You know, two, two year olds want what they want when they want it. If they looked at it five minutes ago, it's theirs. If they held it yesterday, it's theirs. It's important stuff to know about a two year old because when they start doing those things, well, yes, they're two. That comes up a lot. Trying to parent with your partner um, comes up a lot, especially if you have two different viewpoints about how to parent and why you're parenting and what your role is. There are a lot of scenarios about this, this behavior is happening for my child and what can I do about it, which often comes to a, a lot of questioning about why is it important? To, am I trying to stop the behavior? Why is that important to me? You know, how do I want to go about that? A lot of discussions about values and what people value in their families. Yeah, that seems like the whole gamut of questions. And as a parent myself, I can't even imagine approaching these issues in that type of role. Because when you're talking about child behaviors, there's going to be this connection. And my wife talking and I talk about this all the time trying to, I guess, be a better parent, because even the word better means that there's some inadequacy. How do you even approach a subject like this without causing a caregiver or a parent to be on the defensive? It's a good question, because I think what's happened over the years is that there's more and more and more information and books to read out there and podcasts and everything that tells you how to be a good parent. So the whole thing of and what's happening on social media right now on Facebook, and there's a lot of stuff out there right now that's telling us that we're not doing a good job as parents. So there's already a lot of internal conversation um, that's going on in our heads about what we're doing and a lot of questioning. 
And then we, then on top of that, we have whatever's happened in our own families around our own parents and whether or not we want to do things the same way or differently. And I'm never going to do that to my own kids. And then we do it and then, ah, so it's a hard place to be in. And um, I honestly, I think what happens for me is that a lot of people come to groups because they want their children to socialize. So they come to groups that way. And then when they get here, they don't want to leave because they find that it's what they needed. So I think it really is because of what you're talking about. It's hard for people to get to parent groups. And when it's an environment that that's accepting and people who are supportive, I mean, I can't tell you how many times people come years later and say, I was in a hard spot when I got to the, the grapevine and parent groups and it saved me. I think that's why I'm so excited to circle back because it's like you feel like that as a parent, you're relighting the same candle over and over and over and over. So I wonder what are some of the things that with a newborn or expecting parents, can you speak to some of the things that they might be going through in preparation or that they've now found themselves in that come up a lot in your parent parenting groups? Well, I, you know, I think when people are pregnant and I can even speak to my own experience, I had a lot of ideas about what it was going to be like, a lot of hopes, you know, right, right into the, the labor and what, what I wanted that to look like. And then right away you find out <laughs> But there are a lot of things you don't have control over. And I think that's kind of the, the prep for the parenting because there are a lot of things you don't have any control over. And I think um, I think when you can start looking inside and seeing all of those things, all of the things that you want and that you wish and that we hold on so tightly to that we that we have a hard time facing what's in front of us. I think, you know, I think a lot of it's related to that. You know, I really wanted a baby that didn't cry so much. You have a baby that cries a lot. And then what do you do with that? Because children, right from the beginning, if we have things happening inside of us, they'll bring them out. Um, the phenomenon now of this parenting second time around, the posture groups. And I'm wondering with those groups and kind of revisiting parenting for, you know, those relative and kinship caregivers, what is the difference between having that type of group and say the parents of a newborn? One of the things that I noticed was that when you have grandparents come in that have taken on the care of their grandchildren. And that's the primary, primarily what we see is grandparents who are parenting their grandchildren. So the, the grandparent has been through more life experience than a young parent. So that just right off makes it really different because their life experience is different and they look at life differently. So the other thing that's happened is that they often have their grandchildren because something traumatic has happened in their lives. Whatever that is, they've taken on the care of their grandchildren. So there's some something that's happened during that time and they feel traumatized by it and their grandchildren feel traumatized by it. I've also seen that the, the grandparents that I've seen are highly motivated to create a good life for their grandchildren. It's just a different different point of view. They're not really their children, but they've dedicated their their lives to create something good for their grandchildren. And um, I just really admire them. They're, they're at such a different stage in their lives when they're parenting. And they've already been through parenting once or twice or three times or however many children they have. So it just looks different. So you often have the perspective, even I have the perspective now with my grandchildren to look back and say, okay, I did that with my children and I know of a different way. So I'm going to try something different this time. I would invite new strategies, you know, a lot, a lot of different things. And I mean, the culture has changed around it too. Are you finding that since they do come in with a different perspective and having much more lived experience, that the fundamental challenges, um, is there any sort of consistency to what you're seeing, even though that is so highly unique to their situations? What, what I'm seeing is that most of the grand families have been going along in their lives. Some of them have retired. They're looking at retirement. Um, they have a fixed income. They've made a life for a small family, maybe them and a partner. They have a small home. They've done a lot of things they want to do. They kind of have an idea about where they want to move forward. And then all of a sudden their life changes. So um, they're looking at bringing 
children into their home that was, wasn't really set up for children. Some of them spend all of their savings to um, do whatever they need to do around courts or buying their children clothing or a bed. There's often some kind of trauma that's happened with their own children. So they're dealing, emotionally dealing with that and whatever happened. And sometimes that's not just one event. It's long term, like years. If we're talking about substance misuse, it can go on for years in and in and out. The children going back and forth and watching that happen to your grandchildren and not knowing how well they're being taken care of. So the the magnitude of that shift for them is huge. So you had you were a grandparent. You got to be a grandparent. You got to go in and play and buy them things and have fun with them. And then all of a sudden you're responsible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I imagine too, is now the you know even dealing with this pandemic, this you know the technology desert. You used to talk about this a lot, but now all of a sudden we're uh, navigating a remote like situation in school, which takes a lot of different equipment and knowledge and, and things like that. I can't imagine, and yet I keep thinking about these the parenting groups. When I my mind comes to it, I'm thinking there's things I want to correct, but there's also I want to seemingly do and feel something that I'm not feeling less or I want to feel something else. I want to feel less stressed. And it's silly to say it like this, but sometimes I think I want to feel listened to as a parent, you know? So it feels, it does feel like in these parenting groups, I'm looking for solutions for me. But when I've seen, when I've seen families create the biggest shift, they're families that have been looking at this for years. This is not, I'm going to go do an eight week parent class and change everything I do because we're habitual people. We do the same things over and over again. So I've asked the question maybe a thousand times, is that working for you? And is it working for your child? And if it's not, then let's figure out something else that you can do. And that's what we do. We go back to the same things over and over again because it's, it goes on automatic. So um, so that's the hardest part, I think, is it's great to have a conversation in here. And a parent is saying, yes, yes, I want to do this differently. And the next week they come back and say, guess what? I did it again. I think the key is to continue to ask the question, is what I'm doing working? How does it feel to me? What is it teaching my child? And that's a biggie. What is my child learning from this? Because the greatest things that they learn come from what they see in us. So if we're talking about to our kids about how to treat other people and we're unkind to other people, that's what they see. That's what they take in. Yeah. So the other thing, I just want to say the other thing that comes into play is that there's the question of how you see your job as a parent and what is it that you want to do with your children. So children are not always going to be able to stop themselves from hitting. That's that's the goal. That's the end goal is that they won't hit people. But when they're three or five, they can't always do that. If that's true, and I believe it is, then what is our job as a parent if we want them to be able to do that? It's to teach them to be able to do that. Thank you so much, Carol. If people want to learn more about parenting groups offered by the Grapevine or any of the many services they provide, go to grapevinenh.org. Again, that's grapevinenh.org. Many thanks to New Hampshire's Office of Social and Emotional Wellness for sponsoring this podcast. Started within New Hampshire's Department of Education, the Office of Social and Emotional Wellness consolidates policy development and implements projects and programs that are focused on health and wellness with an emphasis on behavioral health of all students, youth, and families. To learn more about the Department of Education and its many programs and approaches, visit www.education.nh.gov. 